Thank you. Um, the book of, um, well, the story of Joseph is a great human story, isn't it? In lots of ways. It's been popular at the theatre for years and years and years through Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat. And no wonder, because um, it's a story that has a very contemporary ring to it, doesn't it? It's the story of a man's rise from rags to riches, of tragedy turning to triumph. And along the way, there's a bitter family feud, there's intense rivalry, there's personal ambition, there's betrayal, there's forgiveness, there's reconciliation, there's a widespread famine, international aid relief. And in that sense, it's an epic tale. It's a great human story. But I guess the question that we would want to ask is, why then is it in the Bible? What is it there for? Why does God give 14 chapters of the book of Genesis over to this one man's life, the story of Joseph? And I guess it's because it's not merely a great human story, and it is, but it's also part of a great divine story, a greater divine story. Now, you can usually tell the most important character in the play by how many lines they've got. Do you remember that from school plays? As you added up how many lines you got and where you were in the ranking and so on. So I think in Shakespeare, Hamlet is the role because nearly half of the lines spoken in Hamlet are, Shake uh, are Hamlet's own words. Um, but if you were to read the book of story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, you'd be mistaken for thinking you could measure who the main character was by the number of lines that they were given. Because in this story, the main character is actually strangely silent. He has only one scene, a few lines, and yet from start to finish, the main character is God. And that's not my personal conclusion, that's Joseph's personal conclusion. So keep a thumb in uh, Genesis chapter 37 and flick on to the end, would you? To the verse that really summarizes everything for us, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. It's probably the key verse in the whole book. We're going to keep coming back to it time and again. And here Joseph is speaking to his brothers, the brothers that we've just read in chapter 37 who have sold him into slavery. And this is what Joseph has to say, chapter 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. At the end of the story, Joseph is able to look back over his life, even the parts marked by tragedy and evil, and he could see the hands of a sovereign God working out his purposes. So I want to say God is the main character because Joseph believes he's the main character. And this book, as Jeremy's already hinted at, is a, is a story of a sovereign God. How many of us have found comfort in a verse like that? Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Um, just close your eyes just for a moment. Just close your eyes and listen to these thoughts. God is in control, so nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing happens that God in his sovereign wisdom does not allow. God is at work for all things, even in the face of evil. Okay, you can open your eyes again now. Those are profound concepts, aren't they? They are deeply encouraging and helpful ideas to have with us if we're Christians through our lives. That even though human agents, maybe even spiritual agents, are at work for evil, God is sovereignly at work for good. So Joseph is speaking of what theologians call divine providence. So yes, God is sovereign over all things, but if you think about the everyday details of life, that's what we're talking about when we talk about providence, the circumstances of life, the things that we take for granted that have happened to us today that have been good, when a day has been a good day and we just think, yeah, I've had a great day. Actually, God has been at work protecting us from evil, watching over our lives, keeping us well, and in a thousand ways, blessing us. God's providence. Harder to see when something's gone wrong. 
although we thought a little bit about how maybe we can even look back on our own lives and see where God has been at work. But the graphic that we have for this series is this kind of idea of a ball in a maze. Maybe you've had one of those kind of toys where the ball is kind of you're trying to get the ball from A to B across the maze through all sorts of dead ends. Maybe you've even done been to Hampton Court Maze or somewhere else, and you get the idea. Sometimes you don't know your way ahead. Life seems to be have its dead ends. You have to step back and retrace your steps and try a different route. But God is sovereignly at work. And Joseph knows it at the end. So the Joseph story for us, if we are here as Christians, is an opportunity for us to learn what it is to trust God with our circumstances. He sees the end from the beginning, and you don't. So things are going to happen in your life and mine that are going to, to use a very English idiom, knock us for six. We're going to have the rug pulled from under our feet. We're going to face disappointments, distress, difficult circumstances, tragedies. We can't see the end from the beginning, but God can. So just this week in a headline in the newspaper, it said this, Britons living in fear as record numbers suffer from anxiety. Britons living in fear as record numbers suffer from anxiety. There was a report from the Mental Health Foundation, and it's called In the Face of Fear. 2,000 adults surveyed and found, discovered, among other things, that two out of three adults worry about their current financial situation. The director who commissioned the survey said, this report shows that fear is having a seriously negative impact on the mental and physical health of the nation. He goes on, the modern world will test our resilience again and again, and people need to know how to process their emotions better to prevent harm to their mental and physical health. And I step back as a Christian, I think, boy, how do you work through life when you believe there's no one in control? That there's no one working for good necessarily in your circumstances. That life is just a lottery. And some people are going to get lucky and other people aren't. How do you stay well emotionally and mentally when you think you're on your own and you have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring? I don't know. But for Christians, the doctrine of providence gives us courage, gives us hope, gives us strength. As we say, well, I don't know the end from the beginning, but I trust a Father in heaven who does. So if you are here as a Christian, in a world full of anxiety, for you, when you don't know what tomorrow will bring, to know that God is in control is a life-changing lesson. It has great power. So the book of Joseph is going to teach us all the way along God is the star of the show, okay? You're not going to meet him very often. In fact, there'll only be one talk where God speaks. And I think that's quite deliberate, actually, in the narrative. Because when you look at the story of Abraham, or Isaac, or even Jacob, God is speaking quite a lot. But here in the Joseph narrative, he only speaks once. And he only speaks to reassure Jacob that he should leave the land that God has promised him and go to Egypt for food. That's the only time God actually speaks because J Jacob would otherwise think it was a direct act of disobedience to leave the promised land and to go to Egypt. So God steps in at that point to say something, but that's it in the whole, in the whole story. But God is always at work in everything. And that's what we're learning as, as we go through um, this story. All the Bible really is a story of a God who sees the end from the beginning but actually doesn't tell us everything. Maybe because we wouldn't understand it. Maybe because it would frighten us too much if he did. I don't know. Maybe because our faith would weaken if he told us the end from the beginning. But if he just tells us what we need to know, when we need to know it, and to trust him with the rest, maybe that's the way we grow as Christians. So what are we meant to learn from this story of the Bible? Well, the first clue is the identity of Joseph. Joseph. 
So if you don't know who he is in the Bible story, in the big picture, what you really need to know is he is the great-grandson of Abraham, the great-grandson of Abraham. And the reason you need to know that is because after the fall, when everything goes wrong in the world, when our world turns into a place of chaos and carnage, God steps in and says to Abraham, I will make you your name great and a great nation out of you and all the peoples of the world will be blessed through you. So God's plan to put the world right includes Abraham and his descendants. So somehow Joseph matters because he's the great grandson of Abraham. So if God's got a plan to put our world right, Abraham, then Joseph. And God's promise must include him in some way. And we'll see in the story how God's promise which ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus, is threatened by, for example, famine in the Promised Land. So there's Jacob and all the descendants of Abraham in a country with no food. And what God is going to do is save his people from famine through Joseph. So who Joseph is really matters. He's the great-grandson of Abraham, and he's important um, to us. So the story of Joseph is about a sovereign God, But it's more than that. It's about a sovereign God who is sovereign to save his people. And that makes it important and personal um, for us. God is a God who delivers. So do you see, if you look at chapter 50 and verse 20 again, that this is not just about a sovereign God, but a saving God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. How so? In what way was what we just read in chapter 37 going to be for good? What is the good that Joseph could see that had happened? Do you see the end of that verse? What is the good? To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So if they'd never sold Joseph into slavery, he would have never ended up in Egypt. If he'd never ended up in Egypt, he could never have become ruler effectively over Egypt. And he could never have gathered enough food in Egypt so that all of his family could come to Egypt and be fed during the famine and saved from starvation. And therefore, their descendants continue and Jesus finally be born into the world. That is the good, the saving God. And of course, the third thing that this story reveals is not just a sovereign God and a saving God, but a gracious God. Because look at what Joseph has to say to his brothers in the next verse, chapter 50 and verse 21. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. God's saviour, Joseph, has mercy on his disobedient brothers. And your saviour, Jesus has mercy on you as disobedient brothers and sisters. So we rightly say, if I'd been there in that crowd before Pilate, I too would have shouted, crucify him, crucify him. I was responsible for what happened to Jesus, but Jesus has mercy on me and says, do not be afraid. I will provide for you. What is it that Jesus has done? He saved us, not just with some food, but with eternal life itself. So Joseph is a picture of Jesus, of the sovereign God, the saving God, and the gracious God. It's a miniature story of how God is sovereign, saving, and gracious all the way through. That's the story of the Bible. So how is God going to bless the world? Well, let's look into first chapter 37 briefly, having thought a bit about the big idea of the whole book. I'm going to say things briefly and just in two points. God saves his people by raising up his ruler. That's verses 1 to 11. So back to chapter 37. God saves his people by raising up his ruler. Now, Joseph's family sounds particularly modern, doesn't it? It's the kind of household that Louis Theroux might feel at home in, just for a weekend with a TV documentary uh, uh, film. We have one father, four mothers, one of whom is deceased, and 12 sons. That's, that's good Louis Theroux territory. 
with children from different marriages. Jacob is also called Israel in the story. So where you see Jacob and Israel, it's the same person. Don't be too confused. For Jacob, he has a favorite son as well. So verse 3, Israel, same person as Jacob, Israel loved Joseph, verse 3, more than any of the others. Born to him in old age. He'd also been born to Jacob through his favorite wife, Rachel. So he was a special son, an unexpected son, a delight for him. It's not enough for us to just think that he was special to Jacob. We also need to understand how that was a provocation to the other brothers. For Jacob gave him a richly ornamented robe. It's not that the coat Joseph was wearing is a fashion statement. It's more a statement of authority. This is my chosen heir, if you like. This is the one who stands to inherit. The only other time that this word, robe, here we have in Genesis 37, the only other time it's used in the Bible is to describe a royal robe of the kind the princess daughters of King David wore. So it's a sign of authority. It's a statement of position and privilege. Joseph is the special one. And when the brothers saw how their father loved Joseph, look at verse 4, they hated Joseph and could not speak a kind word. Or a better translation is they could not speak peaceably to him. And hatred turned to hostility. In one sense, the actions of, of Jacob are a picture, a prophetic statement of the royal robes that Joseph would wear one day. So he got a, a coat of many colors from Jacob. One day that would pale into insignificant with the robes that Pharaoh would give him to wear. So Jacob was kind of actually telling us something about the future in giving him this cloak, but it provoked his brothers. But I want to say that what Joseph does next isn't necessarily a wrong thing. See, Joseph tells his brothers about a dream, or in fact, two dreams. And the key question for us is, who gave him those dreams? Where did they come from? Too much cheese? A vivid imagination? Pride and arrogance? No, that whenever Joseph gets dreams in this story, those dreams are from God. So his father gives him a royal robe, and he is given by God a vision of the future in which he will be ruler over his brothers. And that's exactly what happens. They do come to him and bow, prostrate themselves before him and ask him for mercy and ask him to provide for them. So in one sense, what Joseph is doing is just saying what God has said would happen. Joseph's entire family would one day bow down before him. So I don't think Joseph is on a massive ego trip here. I think this is God speaking to him. And the reason that he gets two dreams, as he does elsewhere in the narrative, is that that's a divine confirmation that you haven't made this up. You've not just, whoa, what was that dream all about? But I've got a second one, and it's the same theme. It's divine confirmation. So Joseph is God's man. He's going to be God's ruler. Jacob gives him robes, and God gives him dreams. He's going to be the ruler. But, of course, he's going to rule in a way that provides for his brothers. That's what he's going to do ultimately. Now, the family, they go ballistic. They hit the roof when Joseph kicks off about his dreams. The response is very clear. Verse 4, they hated him. Verse 5, they hated him all the more. Verse 8, they hated him all the more. Verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him. Why? Look at verse 8. Why are they going ballistic? Verse 8, do you intend to rule over us. Will you actually rule us? And of course the answer is yes, he will. Out of divine choice. It's God's intention that this is what's going to happen. He will rule over them. And their anger and their indignation is in many ways a rejection of what God is saying through the dreams to them. They're not just angry with Joseph, in a sense, they're angry with God. We do not want him ruling over us. Just like Jesus' own mother and brothers, who in Mark chapter 3 
declare him to be out of his mind. They want to take him out of public ministry, take him back, take him home. We see it in the New Testament picture as well. The sovereign God who raises up a ruler. And yet this ruler's family reject him. And that's exactly what happens when Jesus comes. God raises up a ruler for us in King Jesus. And we, the human race, said, who made you ruler over us? We say exactly what the brothers say in verse 8, don't we? That's what we said to Jesus. Who do you think you are? Who made you? Do you really think we're going to bow down to you? And so humanity rejected the rule of Jesus. And instead, didn't just sell him into slavery, but crucified him on a cross. So God is a God who delights to bless his people by raising up a ruler. And yet God's people reject their ruler and threaten the very promise and purposes of God. That's what happened to Joseph, and that's exactly what happens with Jesus, isn't it? Will you rule over us? So the whole 14 chapters of this narrative, the Joseph story, are really about how God is going to actually fulfill his plan to raise up a ruler who will provide for all his people, how God is going to fulfill his plan even though human beings will fight him all the way. That's what's going on in Joseph. Human beings are going to fight God all the way, but God's going to bless them anyway. And that's the story of the Bible, isn't it? Jesus comes, what do we do? We fight God all the way. Who made you ruler over us? And yet God says, do you know what? Even though you crucified my son, risen, resurrected from the dead, that son will bless you and forgive you. And just as Joseph said to his brothers, do not be afraid. So Jesus says to us, do not be afraid. What you intended for evil God intended for good. So the second big idea, and I need to finish up, is that God saves his people by rescuing his rejected ruler. So God's going to save his people by raising up a ruler, but God saves his people by rescuing his rejected ruler. So this hatred, this jealousy, this rivalry, the brothers, at first they decide to kill him. But, of course, they then change their minds and decide that they're going to sell him into slavery. And what we discover is that um, God is at work, I think, through this plan. So verse 15, if you look carefully, um, we read these words. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the field and asked him, Who are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for his brothers. So God got Joseph to his brothers through this, through this man. The man was there just where he needed to be to get Joseph to his brothers. And then his brothers see an opportunity to kill him, but Reuben intervenes. They strip him of his royal robes and throw him into a cistern. And he could have just died, couldn't he? But lo and behold, at just the right time, in just the right place, come some slave traders. And if they hadn't been there at that moment, Joseph's brothers would have left him for dead. But because those guys come along at just the right time, in just the right place, they have this change of plan and they decide to profit and to make money. So Joseph lies in the cistern. He doesn't know what's going on. His dreams look as if they're in ruins, don't they? Where is God in all of this? How could God fulfill his promise to him in all of this? God seems absent. God seems cruel. He doesn't seem to care for Joseph. And yet Joseph is going to work through this plan to get Joseph to Egypt, where he needs him to be. But it's a long story, and at this point in the story, maybe you feel a little bit like Joseph. Joseph's dreams, by the end of chapter 37, seem to have turned into a nightmare. He's in slavery. His father believes him to be dead, 
He's being carried off by these men to who knows where, to face who knows what. I don't know what it would have been felt like for Joseph at exactly that point. But we have the privilege of knowing the end from the beginning of at least this one story that God was going to be at work. It's God is the one who rescues Joseph from that system. But in a way that is just providential, the slave traders just happened to be there when the brothers were there. And they're able to sell him, and God uses that to get him where he needs to be. The very rejection of their ruler is the means that God is going to use to save them. And that is the case in the gospel for us too, isn't it? The message of the Bible from start to finish is God is going to save us despite our sins. Not because of the good things we've done, but actually through the wicked things that we've done. So maybe you're here and you're not sure whether you're a Christian. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, well, I don't know whether God would ever forgive me for the kind of things that I could do or have done or might do. And the point is, God is a God of extraordinary mercy. Jesus prayed for those who crucified him as they drove the nails into his hands. God rescues these brothers of Joseph even after they've sold him into slavery and told their own father that he'd been killed by ferocious animals. And yet God saves them all. So whatever we've done, whatever we think we're capable of doing, God is bigger than our sin. And in his sovereignty, this story reveals that to be true. And of course, the cross itself reveals that to be true more than anywhere else in the Bible. The story of the gospel reminds us that we are like the brothers. We would reject Jesus. We would wish him dead. And yet God shows extraordinary love and mercy to us as he did to these brothers. Let's take a moment to pray, and then we can chat in our groups. Father, 